History of Palestine The Stone Age and the Copper Age The Paleolithic period Old Stone Age in Palestine was first fully examined by the British archaeologist Dorothy Garrett in her excavations of caves on the slopes of Mount Carmel in 1929-34. The finds showed that at that stage Palestine was culturally linked with Europe, and human remains were recovered showing that the inhabitants were of the same group as the Neanderthal inhabitants of Europe. The Mesolithic period, Middle Stone Age, is best represented by a culture called Natufian, known from excavations at Ain Malaha and Jericho. The Natufians lived in caves, as did their Paleolithic predecessors, but there is a possibility that they were experimenting in agriculture. For the importance to them of the collection of grain is shown by the artistic care that they lavished on the carving of the halves of their sickles and in the provision of utensils for grinding. During the subsequent Neolithic period, New Stone Age, humans gradually undertook the domestication of animals, the cultivation of crops, the production of pottery, and the building of towns example, Jericho by 700 BCE. Excavations also have provided a picture of events in Palestine in the 5th to 4th millennium BCE, during which the transition from the Stone Age to the Copper Age took place. It was probably in the 4th millennium that the Gasulians immigrated to Palestine. Their origin is not known. They are called Gasulians because the pottery and flints characteristic of their settlements first attracted attention in the excavations of Talalit al Ghassel in the Jordan Valley. There was a permanent village site with several successive layers of occupation, and the site probably was associated with reasonably efficient agriculture. The phase can be called the Enealithic or Chalcolithic period or the Copper Age, since copper axes were found at Talalit al Ghassel, and this is confirmed by the finds at sites near Beersheba. With pottery and a flint industry allied to those of Talalit al Ghassel but not identical with them, at Beersheba, there was a copper working industry, which presumably imported or from Sinai, and there was also evidence of an ivory working industry, both proving the growth of a class of specialist craftsmen. Discoveries near Engadi have revealed a shrine of that period in basketry, ivory, leather, and hundreds of copper ritual objects were found in the Nail Mishmar caves of the Judean desert. The region in which the Gasulian settlements have been found is mainly in the south of Palestine with an extension up the coastal plain and its fringes. These settlements seem to have died out and disappeared in the last centuries of the 4th millennium, about the same time that a new population immigrated, probably from the north. Thereafter, the composite elements in Palestine consisted of the indigenous Neolithic Chalcolithic population, the Gasulians, and these latest immigrants. In time, the peoples were amalgamated into what was to become the sedentary urban population of the Early Bronze Age and the Third Millennium. The Bronze Age Early Bronze Age Most of the towns that are known in historic times came into existence during the Early Bronze Age. The growth of these towns can be approximately correlated chronologically with the development of the Old Kingdom in Egypt. Early Bronze I corresponding to the late pre-dynastic period and Early Bronze II being cross-dated by fines to the time of the First Dynasty, c. 29-25 BCE. Evidence of the early phases of the Early Bronze Age comes mainly from Megiddo, Jericho, Tal Al-Fara, Tel Betshin, Kerbet Al-Karak, and Ai Kerbedai. All these sites are in northern or central Palestine, and it was there that the Early Bronze Age town seemed to have developed. The towns of southern Palestine, for instance, Tel Lachish, Kiriasefer, and Tel Asai, seem only to have been established in Early Bronze III. The town dwellers, identified as the original Semitic population, can, for the sake of convenience, be called Canaanites, although the term is not attested before the middle of the second millennium BCE. In the course of the third millennium, therefore, walled towns began to appear throughout Palestine. There is no evidence that the next step of unification under the leadership of a single town took place in the region, as it had in Mesopotamia and Egypt. Palestine's towns presumably remained independent city-states, except insofar as Egypt may at times have exercised a loose political control. By about the 23rd century BCE, the whole civilization had ceased to be urban. During the next phase, it was pastoral and was influenced by the settlement of nomads probably from east of the Jordan River. Among the nomads, Amorites from the Syrian desert may have predominated. 
It is not yet fully understood how these events are related to the creation of the Akkadian Empire in Mesopotamia under Sargon of Akkad and his grandson Naramsin, 24th and 23rd centuries BCE, and to the latter's destruction of the powerful kingdom of Ebla, modern Talmardic, in neighboring Syria, nor is the extent of Eblite and Akkadian hegemony over Palestine in this period known. It does seem reasonable, however, to associate the incursion of nomads from the east with the invasions of Egypt by people from Asia that brought the Old Kingdom to an end. An initial date of 23rd to 22nd century BCE, depending on the interpretation of the Egyptian evidence, and a final date of the 20th century BCE seem probable. The picture of Palestine at this period is thus unequivocally that of a region occupied by a number of allied tribes. Although they had many features in common, there were also many differences. The most significant point is that, with the possible exception of the northern group, they made no contribution at all to town life. The different groups had tribal centers, but they were essentially semi-nomadic pastoralists. This description fits well that given in the book of Joshua of the Amorites who lived in the hill country, as opposed to the Canaanites who lived in the plains and on the coast, areas favorable to agriculture. Middle Bronze Age it was, in fact, the next period, the Middle Bronze Age, that introduced the Canaanite culture as found by the Israelites on their entry into Palestine. The Middle Bronze Age, c. 2000, c. 1550 BCE, provides the background for the beginning of the story of the Hebrew Bible. The archaeological evidence for the period shows new types of pottery, weapons, and burial practices. Once more, an urban civilization based on agriculture was established. It is not entirely clear whether the wave of urban development after the 20th century BCE was the work of a new immigrant people accustomed to town dwelling or of the local inhabitants themselves, some of whom may have adopted a sedentary lifestyle and begun, as in Mesopotamia and Syria, to establish dynasties. But where they settled, towns of the widespread Middle Bronze Age civilization of Palestine emerged. This civilization was intimately connected with that of the towns of the Phoenician Canaanite coast. Extant Egyptian documents provide valuable information about Palestine in the period of the Egyptian 12th dynasty, 1938 to 1756 BCE, and argue for significant Egyptian interest and influence in Palestine at this time. Most notable are the popular literary work known as the Story of Sinu, detailing the hero's exile in the Palestinian region in the 20th, 19th century execration texts. Inscriptions of Egypt's enemies' names on pottery, which was ceremonially broken to invoke a curse. The culture introduced at this stage was essentially the same as the culture found by the Israelites who moved into Palestine in the 14th and 13th centuries BCE. A large repertory of new forms and pottery arose, and for the first time in Palestine, the clay was turned entirely on a fast wheel. Comparisons of Palestinian early Middle Bronze pottery forms with metallic and ceramic forms at Byblos, dated by Egyptian contacts, suggest that these forms were brought to Palestine about the 19th century from coastal Syria. Bronze weapons of a distinctive type, paralleled also on the Syrian coast, have been found at Megiddo, Jericho, and Tal Alajul. Town life in Palestine gradually expanded after the mid-19th century BCE, but the material culture was essentially a direct development from the preceding stage. Several towns of Middle Bronze Age Palestine were defended by plaster-faced ramparts, clearly discernible at Jericho and many other sites. An imported method of fortification giving evidence of a new and alien influence superimposed on the existing Canaanite culture. These were probably introduced by the Asiatic Hyksos, possibly related to the Amorites who secured control of northern Egypt about 1630. The Hyksos may have included elements of a grouping of people, largely Semitic, called the Habaru or Haparu, Egyptian Apiru. The term Habaru, meaning outsiders, was applied to nomads, fugitives, bandits, and workers of inferior status. The word is etymologically related to Hebrew in the relationship of the Habaru and aforementioned Hyksos. To the Hebrews has long been debated. The Habaru appeared to have established a military aristocracy in Palestine, bringing to the towns new defenses and new prosperity, as well as many Egyptian cultural elements, without interrupting the basic character of the local culture. This was to survive the destruction of Megiddo, Jericho, 
and Kiria Sefer that followed the Egyptians' expulsion of the Hyksos into Palestine at the end of the Middle Bronze Age. Late Bronze Age There was no sharp break between the Middle and Late Bronze Age in Palestine. Shortly before the death of Amos I, 1514 BCE, the first native pharaoh of the New Kingdom, the Egyptian armies began to conquer Palestine, probably completing their task during his successor's reign. Under Queen Hatshepsut, 1479-58, Palestine revolted against Egyptian domination, but the rebellion was put down firmly by her successor, Thutmose III, who established a stable administration. Maintained through the reigns of his immediate successors, Egyptian administrative documents excavated in both Egypt and Palestine show in considerable detail how the provincial government was organized and even how it operated during the century 1450 to 1350 BCE. Documents show, for example, that the land of retinue, Syria, Palestine, was divided into three administrative districts, each under an Egyptian governor. The third district, Canaan, included all of Palestine from the Egyptian border to Byblos. This period is often known as the Amarna Age and is vividly illustrated by several hundred letters written in cuneiform script. Found in Egypt at Tel El Amarna, site of the capital of the heretic King Akhenaten. The unusual concern of the pharaohs with the affairs of Palestine was chiefly a result of the fact that control of it was necessary for the defense of Phoenicia and southern Syria. Menaced by Mitanni until about 1375 and by the Hittite Empire after that date. About 1292 BCE, the increasingly weak rule of the last pharaohs of the 18th dynasty was replaced by the strong arm of the second and third kings of the 19th dynasty, Seti I and Ramses II, 1279-13 BCE. These kings blunted the southward thrust of the Hittites and consolidated the crumbling Egyptian empire. The exactions of foreign bureaucrats, however, combined with internal decay, had so enfeebled the Canaanite vassal princes of Palestine that it was comparatively easy for the incoming Israelites to occupy most of the hill country east of the Jordan River and in western Palestine during the closing decades of the 13th century BCE. Archaeological evidence suggests that the Israelite settlement in Palestine was much more complex and disconnected than the biblical accounts indicate. During a short interlude of anarchy that followed the last weak kings of the 19th dynasty, Egyptian rule was completely extinguished. And the ephemeral victories of Ramses III in the early decades of the 12th century scarcely affected Palestinian history. Subsequent histories of the region have relied heavily on biblical narrative. Although this narrative has been augmented to a great extent by information derived from modern archaeological excavations and, for some historical periods, by outside written sources, it is frequently the major, or sole, source of historical information. However, its validity has often been disputed. The Iron Age The Israelites in Palestine Palestine under the House of David Palestine under the House of David Though the Israelite tribes entered Palestine before the end of the Late Bronze Age, they did not become firmly established in their new home until the early decades of the 12th century BCE. Their number was increased greatly during the settling of Canaan by semi-nomadic Hebrew tribes already in Palestine, as well as by many settled Canaanites, example, the Gibeonites, who joined the invaders against their sedentary neighbors. Excavation has made it clear that the Israelites began building amid the ruins of their precursors, and that new settlements sprang up rapidly all through the hill country. Had events followed their normal course, the resurgent Canaanites, who had not been driven from the coastal plain or the plain of Eshtra-Elon, might have overwhelmed the scattered and unorganized Israelite clans. But this was prevented by the great invasion of the Sea Peoples in the time of Ramses III in the early decades of the 12th century BCE. Among the invaders from the Aegean Basin were the Philistines, who were to conquer much of the region within a century and a half after their settlement in the southern coastal plain. The Philistines have been identified with the so-called Peleset, who were used as garrison troops and mercenaries by Ramses III. Meanwhile, three other peoples were settling east of the Jordan River, the Edomites in the south, the Moabites east of the Dead Sea, and the Ammonites on the edge of the Syrian desert east of Gilead. Considered by the Israelites as fellow Hebrews, these peoples had begun to settle down before the Israelite invasion, and they remained polytheists until the end of the Hebrew Bible period.
The early Israelites possessed a strong centralizing force in their monotheistic faith, combined with a stern code of ethics, which set them apart from all their neighbors. The Mosaic tradition of the covenant between Yahweh and Israel, made concrete by the tabernacle and its ritual, bound the tribes together in a cultic bond resembling the later Greek Amphictyonies. Characteristic of these organizations was a central sanctuary, surrounded by its worshippers. Straining against this religious bond were disruptive tribal forces held in leash by a loose alliance between the tribes, which was often severed by civil war. But for the constant attacks launched by its neighbors, Israel would perhaps never have attained any political solidarity. As it was, salvation from its foes lay only in union, and after abortive attempts had been made at one-man rule, Saul became king of all of Israel, circa 1020 BCE. Saul defeated the Ammonites and the Philistines, but was killed in battle against the latter about 1000 BCE, and was succeeded by David. King David crushed the Philistines, c. 990, and conquered the three Hebrew states east of the Jordan River. After which the intervention of the Arameans from Syria forced him to defeat and annex the states of Aram as far north as the borders of Hamath on the Orontes River. Farther east, he established some sort of control over the nomadic tribes of the Syrian desert as far as the Euphrates River, though it is scarcely probable that Israelite domination was that effective. At home, David organized a stable administration based largely on Egyptian models and, according to tradition, carried out a census of the population. He died before he could complete his plans, but they were put into effect by his successor, Solomon. The reign of Solomon, mid-10th century, represents the culmination of Israelite political history. Though Solomon gradually lost control over outlying territories conquered by David, he was extraordinarily successful in organizing the economic life of the country. He joined forces with Hiram of Tyre, who was leading the Phoenicians toward the exploitation of Mediterranean trade. Expeditions to Ophir, a region probably in either East Africa or India, brought items of wealth such as gold, peacocks, and sandalwood to Palestine. At the same time, the Israelite king entered into trade relations with the Arabs as far south as Sheba or Saba modern Yemen. These activities would have been impossible but for the development of new principles in shipbuilding and for the recent domestication of the Arabian camel and its use in the caravan trade. Among the king's other undertakings was the construction of a fortress or storehouse at a site near the head of the Gulf of Aqaba. The modern site, Tel El Khalifa, may have been the biblical easy and cheaper. Most of the kingdom's wealth was spent in elaborate building operations, which included the Temple of Jerusalem and the Royal Palace, as well as numerous fortified towns. The best known of these are Megiddo, Hazer, and Gezer. But royal activities on such a vast scale cost more than was produced by foreign trade in the tribute of vassal states, and the Israelites themselves were forced to submit to conscription in royal labor gangs as well as to heavy levies of various kinds. It is not surprising that the people of northern Israel revolted after the great king's death, thus disrupting the united monarchy. The rump kingdom of Israel lasted two full centuries, sharing the worship of Yahweh and the Mosaic tradition with its smaller southern neighbor, Judah. After a period of intermittent warfare between Judah and Israel, King Asa of Judah entered into an alliance with the growing kingdom of Damascus, by which the latter attacked northern Israel, thus relieving pressure on Judah. This move cost Israel its territory to the east of the Jordan River and north of the Yarmouk River and ushered in a long series of wars between Israel and Damascus, which did not end until the capture of Damascus by the Assyrians in 732 BCE. The best-known phase of Israelite history is the period during which the great prophets Elijah and Elisha flourished under the Omrides of the 9th century. Omri himself, founder of the dynasty, selected Samaria as his capital and began constructing elaborate defenses and royal buildings, which have been uncovered by excavations. His son Ahab was alternately hero and villain of the principal stories of the prophets. He became involved in complex international maneuvers, which ended with his ignominious death at Ramoth Gilead. The dynasty of Omri ended amid torrents of blood. C. 841 BCE, it was followed by the dynasty of Jehu, which lasted nearly a century. This was a period of extreme oscillations from the catastrophic defeat of Israel. C. 815 BCE, in the destruction of its army by Haziel, king of Damascus, to the triumphs of Jeroboam II c. 
786 to 746 BCE. Meanwhile, Judah also oscillated between periods of prosperity and weakness. When it was strong, it controlled Edom and the caravan routes of the south from Midian to the Mediterranean. When it was feeble, it shrank behind its own narrow boundaries. Great kings such as Asa, Jehoshaphat, and Isaiah alternated with weak kings. In 741-740 BCE, the death knell of independence in Syria and Palestine was sounded by the capture of Arpad in northern Syria by the Assyrian king Tiglath-Pileser III. Events unfolded with dizzying speed. In 738, Israel and Judah paid tribute to Assyria for the first time in decades. In 733, the Assyrians devastated Gilead and Galilee, turning the entire land into Assyrian provinces except for the territory of two tribes. Western Manasseh and Ephraim. In 732, Damascus was captured and Aram ceased to exist as a state, and in 725, the siege of Samaria began. Finally, in the first months of 722, Samaria was taken and Israel became politically extinct. The history of Palestine will be continued in the next part of the video. If you are interested in the history of this country, like and subscribe to our channel. Thank you for your interest in our channel.